Good morning to everybody. I am Alessandra Venturini, the holder of the Jean Monnet Chair in European Migration Studies. I am very glad to open the third series of the seminar Cocumint, the Consumption Cultural Good as Driver of MAGA Integration. This year, the seminar has a special focus. We inquire into the inclusion of foreign artists and we select the contemporary art field because uh, it is uh, in a way uh, less difficult to enter this field. The linguistic difference plays a smaller role, while the cultural difference remains. We notice that foreign artists break into more easily in contemporary art than in other fields. We want also to inquire how the different actors in this field, curators, director of museum art gallery, president, or owner constrain the accessibility of foreign artists in the public arena. In this special lecture, I want to understand if the legislation is putting limit or constrain the choice of the curator of the exhibit organizer. I don't want to take more time. Let me introduce briefly the speaker. Laura Castelli is professor of private law at the University of Milan. She is also a professional lawyer. She is coordinator of the Master in Art and Law, editor of the journal Art and Law. She published many articles, books, and so on. And uh, Sharon Escher, who is an art historian and a curator specialized in contemporary art. She has curated many exhibitions at the Pulitzer Art Foundation, at Harvard Museum, the Venice Biennale. She also worked for the Peggy Guggenheim Collection. But she also has trademarked a method for due diligence for artwork, called it Escher Standard. She taught in many universities in Italy and abroad, but I don't want to take more time. And I give immediately to the two speakers the floor. Please, Laura and Sharon, thank you very much again for participating to the conference. Thank you. The floor thank is you. So I, I can start, Sharon. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, first of all, uh, to Alessandra Verturini for inviting us today. I'm happy to be here with uh, Sharon Ecker, an art historian and curator, uh, with uh, whom I, I have established uh, uh, an active dialogue uh, for the past five years when I started uh, the first edition of my postgraduate uh, course in art law. As a jurist, uh, I'm convinced that uh, art law uh, needs uh, to have a dialogue with experts in the field. Uh, during the course I coordinate, uh, and uh, that uh, can be followed not only by uh, law graduated, but also art history, uh, philosophy and literature graduated, I always organize a dialogue with uh, an art expert and a jurist. And uh, during the edition, I realized how fruitful the dialogue between art and law is how uh, law uh, in the field of art cannot be separated from continuous confrontation with the art expert. The dialogue with uh, Sharon is uh, particularly fruitful because uh, she has uh, experience uh, uh, related not only our country, but also to Anglophone countries such as uh, the US and uh, the UK. Um, today, uh, we will try to see what legal issues uh, can arise when a curator must request a loan of artworks uh, from abroad for a museum exhibition. Um, the assumption is that uh, the Italian law does not impose uh, anything specific. Uh, Sharon can then suggest uh, uh, good practices also through a comparative analysis. Uh, First of all, Sharon, I think that um, it would be interesting to know uh, your personal story. That uh, is also a story of migration and inclusion. inclusion. Yes, um, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, it was lovely to hear uh, Carolyn's story yesterday as well, because I am sort of part of that world. Um, I am a, a foreigner who lives in Italy. I'm American, but actually um, I grew up in Israel 
and my mother is Israeli and my father is American, but uh, my grandparents are Hungarian. So um, I have a very varied background in terms of the family, family history. And so I think that it is uh, the, the outsider in a country, in any country, especially if you are um, not from the country, you um, tend to be a bit more cautious in the country that you are living in. Uh, maybe you listen a little better from the outside uh, before you speak. <laughs> and you always recognize that there are cultural differences and there are difficulties in translation. And sometimes when you are bringing um, an international artist into another country, you do have to be sensitive to that difference. So um, this is a dialogue that we have had with Laura for a long time also about sort of um, how, how we organize these differences uh, in terms of culture when you are curating an exhibition, for example, and what kind of help you can get from the legal world, which is very important when a curator has a lot of responsibility um, to choose works to go into an exhibition space and have to work with different institutions and also to bring a certain art to the public. So you have a great ethical and moral responsibility also when you are making art selections for an art exhibition, not just aesthetic responsibility. Yes. And um, so if uh, we can focus on legal issues, uh, I wanted to start to ask you a thing. The first problem derived uh, from the fact that uh, a work entering Italy uh, could be seized. Uh, therefore, sometimes in order to incentivize the, the loan, the museum sends a comfort letter uh, to the owner of the work uh, in which it guarantees uh, that uh, the property will not risk being seized. In reality, we know that uh, such a letter does not guarantee against uh, seizure. Sharon, what could uh, a curator do in this situation? And what is customary in other countries? So um, I'm an independent curator and I have always worked with different institutions on exhibitions and part of my selection process always has to involve making sure that the works I request as loans are not going to be problematic in any way. Um, in the US and the, in the UK, in my experience when I curated shows for the Pulitzer Art Foundation on Medardo Rosso or others, um, part of my responsibility as a curator was to research as fully as possible the provenance and the attribution, the authenticity of the works as much as I could. Um, and then I would create a report uh, which the museum can then submit to the government, to the American government or the British government, and we apply for something called immunity from seizures. Now, if this is granted, then the work cannot be seized during an exhibition. Um, there have been recent cases where museum curators in other countries also didn't know about the immunity from seizure or they forgot to apply. Uh, it's a lot of work. And there is even one case related to Italy, for example, there was a work that was loaned by the Pinacoteca di Brera to a museum in Florida. And uh, when it was on the wall, it was found that it had belonged to a Jewish family. And so the work was seized because there was no immunity from seizure and it was returned to the family. Uh, they had been looking for it for 15 years. Now the curator uh, probably was not aware that there was this uh, coverage, but also that these things need to be researched actively by the curator. Now in Italy, there is no immunity from seizure, exactly as you said, Laura. So works can be seized during exhibitions and um, comfort letters are nice, but they don't really have any true meaning or weight. Um, and in my opinion right now with the situation as it is, the only solution is for the curator and the hosting museum to each conduct their own independent and thorough due diligence before allowing a work into an exhibition. Um, sometimes even owners themselves don't know that their works are problematic and this can be a problem. So it's, it's always good to have many filters before a work will come in, especially because Italy leaves you in a kind of unprotected state. Okay, and the second question is for the other problem that the curator must deal with uh, concerns uh, the risk that uh, he or she uh, will accept uh, into the exhibition forgeries or work uh, with different kinds of illegal provenance. Italian law uh, does not impose any special control over a curator, who moreover uh, may be liable for crimes. And uh, this is happening now with uh, Modigliani's works in Palazzo Ducale. 
what can a curator do to protect uh, to protect him or herself uh, and what is uh, the approach in the us Hmm. So this is a growing problem, uh, especially because in Italy right now, organizations of exhibitions are often found out, farmed out to external cultural organizers or newspapers or publishing houses or banks. And this is not typically done in other countries. Um, so now there's even a greater risk that due diligence isn't conducted because everybody leaves it to somebody else to check. So the curator thinks the museum will do it, the museum thinks the publisher will do it. It's, it's very complicated because nobody knows whose responsibility it is. And curators can be liable and they need to do their own checking, which is what I was saying before. And um, one of the problems is time. Uh, checking the artworks takes a lot of time. And it's um, unfortunately many exhibitions are put together very quickly. Um, in the US or UK, traditionally, you have three years of lead time to prepare an exhibition, um, and sometimes even more. And uh, so you have the time to check. Um, in Italy, also, there is the placement of the responsibility on one single curator. And um, really, everybody in a museum institution is responsible, the director, the curator, the conservation team the registrars and especially the legal team can really be helpful in these situations because if you have a work that you're not sure about, you need outside experts. Um, sometimes big museums also have very serious scientific committees that they put together for exhibitions with true specialists and they can be a further filter if there's a problematic work. Um, cost is also an issue. Not all museums um, have the resources to um, examine the works thoroughly. So what's really important is that museums create networks with each other. So for example, in New York, if the Guggenheim doesn't have a certain uh, piece of equipment to examine an artwork, maybe the Metropolitan does, and we have they have a network of sharing that they can speak to. Um, also, you should always have a really good network of colleagues that you can ask, because if you don't know, you need to know who to ask. Um, curators really need to engage all their forces to make sure the public is not being shown works that shouldn't be under <laughs> Um, illicitly sourced works also, like looted archaeological works, that's another signpost, uh, works that appear with no provenance, the, the famous inedito that we talk about in Italy, most curators say there really isn't an inedito because um, you would have to spend a lot of time studying it before you could put it in an exhibition. Um, when you are a curator, you're often approached by people who want to, their works in your show for various reasons, and it's difficult because you need to create strong filters before you say yes. So that's another thing that a curator with some experience will find out that I can say okay, but I have to first check everything. So that's really important as well. Okay, thank you very much. And as Alessandro said, aside from being an art historian and curator, uh, you have developed uh, and uh, trademarked uh, a standard for uh, conducting due diligence uh, on art objects uh, that could be useful co for curators and museums. Uh, can you walk us uh, uh, through what an adequate due diligence can look like? Um, yes, this is the course that I, the lesson that I teach in your course. Um, <laughs> yes. It's called, it's called <laughs> <laughs> it's a um, it's a best practices approach to conducting due diligence on artworks, and it, the difference would be that you know some people do some form of due diligence, but they don't do a, a complete due diligence. And so I always say it's the difference between doing gymnastics and doing Pilates. You're doing it according to a certain method, um, and what we call in the field a three-legged stool. You use your eyes and your connoisseurship and knowing what an artwork looks like but you also have to use scientific analysis and you also have to examine provenance, where the work comes from. And this is very important in the cases of Nazi looted works or Ill illegally acquired works, works that should not have left a certain country. Um, all of that has to go through certain amounts of research. And some museums in America are now having dedicated teams to begin to do this kind of work. Okay. Um, in Italy, in uh, <clears throat> absence of uh, regulations uh, imposing such obligation uh, on the curator, the curator normally believes that uh, he or she is safe uh, whenever the work uh, has the authentication of the artist's archive or mm. foundation. In this regard, uh, a recent ruling uh, by the Court of Appeal of Milan recognizes uh, the 
de facto monopoly that archives, uh, archives uh, and uh, foundations have uh, in the authentication market. Even though uh, in Italy, anyone who is an expert uh, based on uh, Article 21 of the Constitution could express uh, an opinion on the authenticity of an artwork. Uh, Sharon, what do you think about the role uh, that uh, foundation have acquired in uh, museum exhibitions? Uh, um, thinking about uh, what has happened in the US, uh, uh, where many archives uh, and the foundation no longer authenticate the works. It's another very delicate issue. Um, you know, in Italy, a foundation or an archive can directly organize or collaborate on an exhibition in a major museum space or a foundation. In the US, it's um, not so accepted because it's seen as a conflict of interest. Um, and curators, in any case, they you're trained to really have your own autonomy in choosing and verifying the works. Um, it's enormous cultural difference and I have seen exhibitions cancelled in the US because of a foundation, you know, feeling that the foundation was too too much too present in the organization. Um, catalog raisonnés, you know, are can be very good. Um, they can uh, also be outdated, they can be wrong, they can contain false or incomplete information. Many, many artists do not have catalog raisonnés. Um, sometimes there are more than one catalog raisonné. Modigliani has five catalog raisonnés and two more that are coming out now. Um, Rembrandt has many catalog raisonnés, De Chirico. So it's a very difficult world to navigate and um, you have to kind of know how to read between the lines. Um, there's also, um, you know, works that have different opinions. I don't know if anybody of you all have seen the recent Vermeer show um, in, in Amsterdam at the Rijksmuseum. There is a work that the National Gallery in Washington has declared is not by Vermeer, but the Rijksmuseum believes it is by Vermeer. And so it's very interesting because they exhibit in the, in the show saying, in this museum, we consider it a Vermeer. So there is also a space a bit for curators to express a different opinion. Um, there are also works that are refused from a catalogue raisonné or that are, you know, um, damaged. There are also forgeries that make their way into the catalogue raisonné. Um, it's very important to work also with archival material and um, know when an attribution also could change, just like the case of this Vermeer. You know, the attribution is not such a stable yes or no answer. It can be a very slippery fish. And just like all scientific examination, all scientific studies, you know, things change. I mean, we had AstraZeneca at the beginning of COVID and now we don't have AstraZeneca anymore. You know, it's more like a football game where every time the, the field changes, you have to think more, more tools become available. Um, it's also the joy of museums that you can actually maybe do an exhibition that talks about this. And in fact, several museums are now beginning to use the museum space to discuss these discuss attributions and saying this can be even an exhibition and we can have the public involved in our process to be very transparent. And it's a great new curatorial strategy. Okay. And in light of uh, what uh, you have served uh, so far, uh, don't you think that uh, it would be important for a museum uh, to have an in-house legal department? Uh, um, I think it's very important and it's very efficient in terms of workflow too. And it's also very cost efficient because curators can very easily work together with a trusted in-house lawyer. Um, anytime you have a doubt, you can reach out to an internal office. Um, it's also very good for the museum's reputation because its legal team is usually composed of figures who work inside the institution and their job is to protect and support the institution. So there's more um, possibility that um, also the museum from inside can decide um, what it would like to have publicly known or what or how to discuss sensitive issues. Uh, today, just like Carolyn was saying yesterday, there are so many sensitive issues because of inclusion. And you really have to know legally also sort of where you stand. I mean, all the way to the wording of the things you write on your labels and in your catalog really needs to be looked at by more eyes than just the curator. But if the museum is small and uh, can't afford in uh, an uh, in house legal department, uh, what other supports may it have? Um, so, in the United States and also in the UK, we have um, associations that 
guarantee ethics and good practices. The College Art Association, I am on their board of directors for the next three years. The um, American Association of Museum Directors, the American Association of Museum Curators, and they offer really good guidance and good guidelines. And so even if you are a, a young curator and maybe you can't <laughs> afford a lawyer or the museum cannot afford a lawyer, they have sample contracts that have been written by lawyers that you can use. Um, there really is a sense that there is a more democratic also kind of greater good um, the way the legal uh, field has supported our associations. So um, it's, I think it's, it's a really good thing and it would be nice if Italy also had sort of governing bodies that would help us in the arts to be ethically and morally on the same page. Okay. And to reduce uh, the risk of legal problems, um, what kind of strategies are uh, US Museum putting in uh, to place to improve uh, transparency uh, about the provenance of works of art uh, that they display? Um, we have to remember that, to, to just like was said yesterday, that exhibitions tell stories and what kind of story you tell is extremely important, especially when you're talking about inclusion. Um, uh, you know, there, is, there, there are stories, uh, human stories behind these things. And so, for example, um, I, I belong to all kinds of groups where we talk about how we can improve uh, questions of inclusion. And for example, one of the things that was, is suggested and is being used is that the labels be written by the community, not by the institution, not by the museum curator and not by the director to sort of decenter the authorial voice. And um, sometimes people say put them side by side with a traditional label, but maybe um, put in the community's voice into the wall label so we're not talking down to the viewer. Um, sometimes people have community advisory committees, so we think about what's right for the community to be able to help. Sometimes, um, you know, uh, they say it's very important not to speak anymore in generalizations, you know, that it's so important to uh, lower the institutional voice and be sensitive to the people who are going to come to this museum to see the show. So some museums, for example, have audio guides now with 18 different speakers. So you have many voices, you know, that you can listen to. Um, not always the art history or the curator voice, but more inclusive and more expansive. And so the curator kind of is a supporter, not a big hero of the show. It's supporting the understanding of the show. Um, and also to know that many different voices exist. And, you know, this would be a wonderful thing in a in a show that has to do with immigrants. You know, you would want to hear it from many different points of view, how they are living the same situation. Okay, thank you very much. I. I have finished with my questions. I know that Alessandra has a question for you. Yes, and for sure also Gian Maria. Okay, you see Sharon, I am always wondering, the curator is more interested in the community of a curator or in the public? You see, because the show is very, you see, especially in contemporary art, I'm sure that we do a, uh, an exhibition on the futurists, that's the one that is in Milan, there is thousands of people that are going, and the public is very happy of the presentation and so on. But this is not something that is so challenging for a curator, because the curator of contemporary art wants a new subject, something new, something which is, especially if you want to include the, or an art, you want to be, what, do something, and Caroline yesterday was speaking of something like this, was saying that that now the the environment is is open, uh, is not, uh, we can discuss, but at least <laughs> more open than in the past. And, but if you look only at your peer, so the intellectual in the field, and you don't look at the public, uh, you see, you have many pressure. On the one, the young foreign artists, they want to show up. They want to participate in the mega show, the industrialized world and the rich world, to show up for the content, but also because in this way they could make money, they could sell their the, the artistic work. On the other hand, the museum, they have to sell tickets. 
because uh, of course uh, the majority of them is paid by the state but also the independent contribution of the tickets is very important and so i i wonder in my reasoning the curator is more interested in like the like the economist like the social science in something new so they are more interested in contributing to the culture to the innovating the culture what caroline was saying yesterday was exactly this she doesn't care about the ticket i didn't ask her about the tickets of the museum but, but because also she was taking a documenta documenta is a special place i never have been in documenta all the people that want to documenta are part of the cream are people that are already very sensitive to the issue they are ready to see after they comment but uh, they are people ready to novelty and so i would like you from you a comment on this if you agree with me that the the public the, the people that buy the tickets are not the objective of the curator um well um i actually am very concerned with that the public is transformed by my exhibitions i don't know about ticket selling i think that comes by itself, if you do a great show, people will come. But I do think that no matter what, if you are an African artist and you are trying to show in Italy, if you are um, a, you know, a South American artist trying to show in Italy, on one level, it has to be meaningful to all of us. And that is a human story. And that, that is part of it. You, know, you have to touch something meaningful that makes sense to us. On the other hand, you have to recognize that you're speaking to a culture that is not yours. And so maybe you have to bring people into your cultural view. And it, there is always a, a translation there. You know, it's not, um, for example, they always speak about the fact that, you know, we can't look at African art just with Western eyes. You know, we have to really understand the culture that it came from and the way something has worked. And I don't think it's so hard to bring the public in if you are open, transparent, sensitive to them. For me, that's that's extremely important. Maybe that's a difference. Um, I don't, you know, I don't care about how many tickets are sold, but I would like some people to come into my shows knowing nothing and coming out of my shows and they have learned something or they have changed or, you know, their feelings have changed about something or the, maybe they weren't so interested in that art and I have gotten them interested in it because I have told it in a way that is 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 has a meaning for them. Um, another thing that I think is very interesting today, I, I think I told you, Alessandra, that we just wrote a book on, uh, it's called Curating Fascism. And we were really thinking about what are innovative ways to speak about a very difficult traumatic period and how do we hold together the beauty of the art from that period with a very traumatic moment in history. And how do we explain that? What kind of education do we have for children who are seeing this for the first time? Um, and we had great examples, for example, Ijaba Shego, who did a beautiful exhibition um, of photographs of Rome with, um, in colonial sites with immigrants posing in front of them. And she deconstructed the idea of a museum because she had it out in the city of Rome. And um, so the very idea of, is a museum still the right place for people to go into and are, what is the role of the curator was thinking again. And um, another one was Maza Mengiste, who wrote a beautiful book called The Shadow King, which has now been translated into Italian. And instead of a museum show, she is a curator as well, she did a website and she asked people, it's an open exhibition on the website, and people can post photographs of their family histories. And it's an ongoing exhibition. So it's really thinking outside the architectural box and outside of what the curator is and how do you reach the world, you know, today in social media, I do care a lot about the public feeling good in my exhibitions or learning something. So I think it's a different approach. Um, I, um, I, I could not do it in another way. I mean, um, even Medardo Rosso, when I did the exhibition at the Pulitzer, it was so important for us to, for them to feel, the viewer to feel, and this is, you know, St. Louis, Missouri, it has nothing to do with Italy in the 19th century, that they could find a connection with his work, you know, a hundred years later. I mean, he's an artist that is so great in Italy, but completely unknown in America. And it was lovely because his idea of art is to walk around a corner and glimpse something. And so we really worked on that idea that the viewer would walk around the corner and just see it. It would be like an apparition. And the works were just poetic. They were floating in space. They were, you know, so beautiful. And my happiest moment was that they trained the guards to give speeches to the viewers. And 
I had two days where I could train the guards to talk about Medardo Rosso, you know, and I was so happy when I walked out of the museum to go back to Italy and I heard the guards giving the talk about, you know, and really feeling that the museum was theirs as well. And so that for me was a really special moment because I felt that, you know, he had come to life again a hundred years later. Thank you very much. Uh, Maria. Yes. Uh, hello, Susan. Hello, Laura. Gian Maria, buongiorno. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks. Very, very uh, interesting interview. Thanks for that. Um, the topic for today is law and, and, and curators, right? So I would like to, um, to open a bit the perspective um, to another aspect of law, which is not law in a technical sense. So the law we need for due diligence and the law we need for authenticity and all these uh, very uh, important and, and central aspects. Uh, uh, rather, I would like to ask both of you uh, uh, to speculate a bit about the role of law as um, as part of the artwork process. Uh, try, to be, try to be clear. Uh, I teach a course on law and art here at the law school, and um, every year I try to have a kind of uh, curatela, curatorial work with students, with some uh, artists, uh, just to mention three of them, Carrie Young, uh, perhaps you know, she's a US British who works with uh, with the normative um, speech, uh, performative speech. Um, Anna Scalfi from Trento, she works on borders, and uh, not only, but uh, the work we had was on borders, and Fatma Buchak from Turkey. And she works on memory and, and um, minorities and discrimination. So with these three artists, uh, we were able in, in the past to organize um, a very little exhibit in the presence of the artist with our students. And I asked the students to invent a kind of new profession, which is the legal curatore, curatore juridico, which means that they were um, interviewing the artist, working on the work which was uh, exhibited. And then during the exhibit, they were receiving the public explaining as law students, what is the meaning of voter? What is the meaning of discrimination? What is a Carrie Young works with the um, the letters of the U.S. Constitution. So, what is um, what has to be understood from the letters of the U.S. Constitution in terms of uh, everyone is equal, but it is not true. Um, and that was very much fascinating because students like so much. And that was a different approach to to um, to interface because Laura opened. Um, her interview saying right um, half an hour ago that uh, the more we go into the more we see that the relationships between art contemporary art and law are interesting and i think that is another aspect so if you would like to comment on that laura do you want to no i i think uh, that uh, in this field uh, um there is often uh, deregulation uh, in the sense that uh, there is a, a little inclination to apply the law. Um, laws do exist, uh, um, but uh, mm, I think that uh, the jurist has uh, to help the expert uh, to know how to apply them. I think so mm, that uh, this is a problem in art law. We have law, but uh, often the art experts doesn't know um, how to apply them, when to apply them. I don't know if uh, uh, Sharon is agree. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, some of the first of all, I want to say that uh, the idea of the exhibition is really fantastic because it goes into that area, which I think is really important of using an exhibition for people to learn something, yeah. you know, and people to challenge their own ideas and to think, I mean, to use it as a tool instead of passively looking at art, which, you know, it, it's, it's, that era is sort of coming to an end and really saying, let's go inside and think about what a concept is, you know, and what is freedom? What is a border? What is, I mean, that for me is a transformative exhibition. Mm -hmm. And I also love the idea of a small exhibition. <laughs> and I love the idea of three different cultures speaking from different voices in the exhibition. So I think it's, it's a really innovative model and it does um, 
I think it really brings people closer to the idea of the law, you know, because the law, as Laura and I speak about all the time, is much more flexible than we think and is much more sort of open ended. And um, people maybe don't understand that, you know, they don't understand that there can be a way to think about challenge, change, um, take what is useful. You know, the Constitution is a great example of something that, you know, is just sitting there with this, you know, words that were meant for another time period and we are still trying to make them work today in america so i think it's a brilliant idea i, I think there should be more exhibitions like that that really take a concept <laughs> and use it um rather than just you know showing artworks which is it you know the museum is a much more flexible institution as well or, or wherever i don't know where you had your exhibition but um and in, in in, in campus at a university. On the campus. So in America, we have many also, you know, probably museums that are inside um, yeah. universities. And it is a fantastic training ground. And sometimes they do the most advanced kind of exhibitions. And you can involve students, which is fantastic. You can have study days, uh, debates, discussions. And so uh, it really comes to life um, more than just kind of a package that you are just selling so that you can do the next exhibition in two months and, you know, do it again or something else. And the big, the brand name artists and things like that, which I think people are a bit tired of. I mean, people go, but there has been even some interesting thinking about that. Is that really the model of exhibitions that we would like to see anymore? You know, so I think it's a real step forward. It's very pioneering. Um, I, I, of course, um, the, the great uh, challenge is to understand each other's fields. So art and law, you know, we have a lot of overlap, but we also have a lot of difference. And so there are moments when, you know, I am very tied to the legal world because I think it's fascinating, but I realize that it's not my field. So, so understanding that we are in two different worlds, you know. And the same thing is for the guys, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the same. So yes, I think, you know, the more the better. I mean, even if you did an annual, you know, um, exhibition series that that brought up different issues, that would be a fantastic step forward for the world of museums and communicate that um, as, a, as a real step forward also for understanding how law can fit into this question. Uh, Sharon, may I ask you something that is always terrifying me? That's mean many times in contemporary art, uh, you need an explanation. So if I visit the, the, the Castle of Rivoli Museum, the first time I went there, I went with friends in the field. They were explaining to me the meaning of what I was seeing. It was Mario Merz, Carla Cardi, the usual, the traditional artists of uh, Arte Povera in Torino and so on. And, this uh, created easily a problem because uh, Gian Maria was illustrating the case of an exhibit where the students were in charge to making the bridge between the public and the artist. While instead the curator would is choosing the the artist, but is not enabled to make the bridge with all the people that are visiting the museum. I am quite superficial, so if I like, I like. I look at the emotion. But my husband, for instance, is not like this. He's asking questions. So <laughs> he wants to know. Want to know. Yes, for me, yes. it's, a, it's a nice color, nice atmosphere. And so I'm very fond of contemporary art because mm -hmm. I'm superficial. Oh, I, <laughs> don't, I'm, a, I'm not emotional. I right. look at the emotion that uh, something gives to me, probably uh, sometimes the wrong emotion, because I interpret the, the artistic thing in the, in the opposite of what has been conceived by the book. Okay, how you can, uh, you can manage this, because uh, this is an incredible challenge for you. Yes, uh, how much to say, especially how much not to say. Yes. Sharon, especially in contemporary art, because if you go, Let's see Masaccio, Michelangelo, and so on. You have the history behind the, the mess awards in a certain case, standardized, uh, or even you can be wrong also in the mess uh, that this classical thing, uh, painting or architecture they give to you. But with contemporary art, with this variety of people, is even more difficult. Yes. So, I, I would follow I will follow them as a third respondent because <laughs> yes, I cannot okay. 
Okay. I, I mean, it's always the problem for the curator is how much, how much of my voice, um, how much labels, for example, the Pulitzer, they don't want labels. They want people to have just the aesthetic experience, just like you said, and they made it very important for me that the aesthetic experience is an experience on its own. And if you can walk from the beginning of the show to the end of the show and enjoy it, and you can walk from the end to the beginning and also enjoy it, that's the most important for them. And so no labels at all. You can ask somebody and they had a brochure. If you want, you can have it. Other museums, they want to put these big wall labels and explain the whole thing. And sometimes it's just a wall of text. I mean, it's really hard. And the whole movement now is to break down that those voices, those labels. Just like you said, what if my opinion is different from this piece of contemporary art? Sometimes um, it's nice to put poetry, for example, next to it because it's short and it's very powerful and it can resonate very beautifully with an artwork, but maybe it doesn't explain the meaning, which could also kill the meaning for somebody. Um, sometimes it's nice to have the artist's voice in contemporary art. Again, you can completely disagree, but sometimes the art, if the artist is alive, not why you made this work, which is always such a difficult and maybe not the right question to ask an artist, or what does this work mean? You know, because again, it risks killing some of the poetry of the work and leaving the space for you to have your own opinion. But certainly, um, if the artist is alive, it can add another layer. At least you know something what the artist thought about their own work. Um, so that's the nice part about contemporary art is you can have the artist there to help you. Um, the curatorial tours, you have to be very careful to impose your viewpoint exactly on, um, on other people because maybe they don't have the same viewpoint. Um, even with older art, it's the same thing, you know. Um, so it, it's a tough question always what to put on the label, how much, how much information can people handle, how much do they want. Um, one of the great compliments of the Vermeer show was that it had very, very few wall labels. It was just you with the artwork, just like you said, you know, you're standing in front of this Vermeer and it really sticks under your ribs how amazing these paintings are. And you don't even know how to explain how beautiful they are and how incredibly done. And I, when I went to Vermeer, I didn't realize um, the woman that is pouring the milk, the very famous painting, I was looking at the milk dropping out of her container and I had never noticed how amazingly beautiful that was. And maybe, you know, if there was so much wall text, I would have been completely distracted and not had that experience. And so the New York Times just wrote an article saying that this is really sort of going back to a very essential way of looking at art and enjoying it. Um, and then there's other people who would like to know what was going on in Delft at the time. And you know, so different people want different things and you have to try to find a way to manage all of that people's expectations. Thank you. Laura? Laura, I think there are legal issues as well around the, how much to say, because sometimes you can be very insensitive and say the wrong thing. So that's another reason why now in America they have sensitivity readers, for example, for the labels and for the catalogs to make sure that, you know, because America is so many different voices, so many different yeah. opinions. So how do you do that? Well, you have to be very cautious. Um, and it can lead to legal problems too. So um, that's another good role of, of, uh, of inside legal teams is that they can help you navigate that. Ah, yes. Certain mm -hmm. words that can't be used anymore, you know, certain expressions, certain ways of thinking. I think it's also a problem of post perspective. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I, I use a lot of, I expose my students to a lot of videos and to the most, I would say, strange uh, and difficult to be understood uh, contemporary artists. And they, frankly, uh, react saying, uh, we do not understand that. What's the meaning? Uh, why? And they say, I continue quoting my students, when I go to a Mozart concert, I understand everything. I like it, I understand it, I'm happy. If I go to a contemporary art um, kind of uh, um, exhibit, I'm unhappy, I do not understand, I don't like it. And that is the same problem you have. I think it's a problem of post perspective. And my, my reaction to my students is the following. Uh, in fact, you do not understand Mozart. You believe you understand Mozart, but you never caught what is the real point made by Mozart vis-a-vis -vis Salieri, Beethoven. Sure. You do not understand why he's using minor, major tunes. You do not understand. Simply, there is a kind of beautiness you are um, you are used to. Uh, so the answer, I think, is um, 
the responsibility is on the public. We have to study if we want to understand. That is, that is I think is, it works for Tiziano as well as for um, um, Hornby. Uh, yeah, we have something in art history that says to make something strange. And even the artworks that you think you know so well, just like Mozart or just like Titian or something, the job is to again make them strange, make them different, make them hard to understand. Because when you understand, then it's over, you know, and <laughs> then you don't need to go anymore. So yeah. sometimes in the contemporary art, it's nice to keep that open and say, I don't that. understand. Yeah, I don't yes. understand. And that's hard, you know. However, Sharon, uh, the exhibit exists in institutional uh, places also to sell the artist, to sell the pain. So that's the reason why I think the communication with the public, if I go to Rivoli Museum and I find an artist that I like very much, I could ask the price <laughs> and think to buy it. And the artist want to be bought because they want to make money. They have to survive. Not They are not all supported by the state. But it's your responsibility to understand. It's not the responsibility of the museum, no, in the my opinion. It's the responsibility of the curator that should help the artist to find the market. Because otherwise, you, you should have a welfare that uh, support the artist. But buyers and collectors, when they buy, they know what they buy, because they know, they, study, they have studied, they, they they have a complete knowledge of the of the process the artist went through, isn't it? If, uh, if the art is not new, is not the artist is not new because the curator when they they propose new art, a new unknown artist, which are very risky because tomorrow they could disappear, they could not paint, and so on. They do this to favor the entrance into the market of this for the gallery that sell them. And so the ability also of the curator to make successful exhibit that everybody is enthusiastic is very important because we prepare the market for this people. That's a view, a view, a, a econom <laughs> economist viewpoint. Alessandro, <laughs> <laughs> do I think also that um, for appreciate uh, contemporary art, uh, uh, must know art in general. You know, you have to. I, I don't know if uh, Sharon is agree, but uh, you have uh, you you must have sensibility and you you must know art in general. So I don't know if it depends uh, from uh, the exhibition and so from from the information that exhibition gives us, or if, uh, or if. Uh, I can appreciate the art uh, if I have uh, knowledge, you know, know about art in general. I maybe, think. yeah, maybe also, you know, the museum, at least in the museums that I work for, they are not um, there to um, make a market for the artist. If that happens as a byproduct, that's something else. But the job is to see if this is a work that is meaningful, that is important, even a contemporary artist. If it's a person who has done a body of work that is really says something to us for our time, um, the rest is really not the museum's business and the curator's business. That the market has its own rules, its own interests, and its own also, um, you know, byways. And so it's not a place that you're doing it with the intention of creating a market for the artist. If you are, maybe that should not be your reason to put it in an exhibition. <laughs> because even Documenta has, you know, it's a, it's a place That's where true. artists are bringing their work because they think it has meaning and it will reach an audience. Of course, they're happy to sell, but I don't think that's their only the only thing that they're ex wanting. They they would like an audience that understands them or that they challenge or a space to have a public voice. Sure, and especially because in this place frequently there are a piece of art so expensive that very few people will buy. We have a, a question of one of the. Go ahead. Yes. Say I your am, name. Uh, yes, Say I'm your name. Luigi. Uh, <laughs> Oh, good. Okay. We were hoping yeah. to see students. Yeah. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, is there an European law or is it only a subject of uh, uh, each, uh, national each law. Yes, national law? And the second one is, what happens if a curator makes an exhibition in a state where he is a censorship uh, that can be of the law, uh, for example, I don't know, the LGBT propaganda in Russia, 
or where there is uh, de facto uh, censorship like I guess uh, in Israel uh, for uh, the genocide of uh, of uh, Palestine what uh, what happened so these are legal questions I think so they go yes. to <laughs> yes, yes but not for a private uh, professor you know <laughs> do you <laughs> You know, I I can't answer you because I I don't uh, I, I I don't know the the, the international law. Perhaps Gian Maria can help us. Yes, uh, yes, with pleasure. The, the first point was. I'm a civil professor. Sorry. <laughs> he was asking about whether there are European yeah. laws. Yeah, we, if there is a European uh, law related to what in particular? Uh, maybe meant for the immunity from seizure? Is that what you're proposing? Yeah. Uh, yes and no. I, I mean, uh, copyright is, is the main bulk of protection for um, artists and for the ones in the market. Uh, copyright uh, is national. In Italy is a 1941 law, which was adopted uh, by the time of fascism and it is still active. But there is also an international frame, first of all, the International Convention, Bern, 1886. So it's a mix of um, international regulation and domestic, plus some European legislation. Particularly for digital art, you find a lot of, now you find a lot of regulation within some um, information society directives related to digital markets. So it's a mix. Meaning that it's not easy to find where the law is. And secondly, I keep it short, but uh, we can continue after work if, after, after if you like. Uh, there is a, a kind of gap. Uh, what uh, with my friend Alessandro Donati, you 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 know very well. I know we we worked on the trying to uh, to understand the challenges brought to law by contemporary art. Just to give you an example. Dematerialization and conceptual art is not fully covered by the law because the law needs objects, things, and, and the copyright needs ideas plus um, expression of the idea. With the focus moving from the object towards the ideas, which characterizes a lot of conceptual art in the 20th century, the law was embarrassed because from the philosophical point of view, before the technical point of view, law needs very clearly identified objects which is i would say luckily not anymore the problem if you sell a secret if you sell a conversation what are you saying what are you selling is that legal that is fascinating that is a, again a way to think to law as a cultural something which goes together uh, with arts and ideas brought in the legal system by artists lead lawyers to think about uh, our categories, perhaps two old ones, you know, going back to the 19th century. So that is also a, a way to fertilize. Um, nice, very nice. Yeah. That's Fine. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, the museum's legal teams have devised now for dematerialized art in America is you can make your dematerialized thing but you have to leave us also something material. So you can play in your sandbox and make your thing that's going to make out of marshmallows and fall apart. But if we are owning a work of yours, you have to leave us with an object. And so they have found some kind of happy medium with this problem. But I think you're right that with NFTs, artificial intelligence, it's going to be more and more problematic because they're not <laughs> going to want to make an object. <laughs> and the, uh, yes, and the compromise is when when instructions become relevant. If you take so you it totally with yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, instead of making paintings, so you it makes uh, instructions on how to paint. Huh? So, and you do not buy a painting; you buy instructions. Instructions. You, yeah. If you, if you attach right. instructions to a contract, these instructions become binding. So you must follow. If you do not follow the instructions, the the work is not there. Work does not exist, and that is also interesting because uh, it brings us to think about uh, invalidity and. Yeah. So thank you for that very much intriguing. It's a great question. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. It's also a second question. You are saying like uh, if the exhibit of art go against the legislation uh, of a country, yeah, censorship. <laughs> yeah. 
illegal art, illegal art is art, even if it is illegal. That applies to street art, that applies to censored. The problem is that uh, illegal art is art. Uh, the law does not like and censored or, or bans, but the market perhaps does not care about. Or in other situations, the market does care. So the value of something which is declared as illegal uh, goes down. It's, it's it goes down or goes up, exactly. Or goes up because it's controversial. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. And I, mean, I think some people, you know, they, they provoke that and some people, they say, I'm not going to make the art in that country. I'll just make it somewhere else and make my statement outside, you know. Okay, fine. Curate, uh, the question is whether there is a legal protection for curators. I would uh, share on the experience is yours, but I would believe that a curator is an, an, an individual like others before the law. So there is not a special space of immunity for curators, right? No, which is why it's a good idea to check your works because <laughs> they will not be protected. And, yes, and to have an insurance perhaps. Yes, yes. and insurance and yeah, good contracts. <laughs> <laughs> But also do your homework, because if you have to sit in front of a judge and show that you did what you could to find out about these yeah. works, you would like to show the traces of that. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody should have to just believe you on your good goodwill. You know, I, I looked at the artwork and I thought it was OK. It's not going to go so well in front of a judge. So I think it's very important for curators to take that kind of responsibility. Not to go to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> not now. I didn't not know. now. <laughs> Otherwise, you become an activist. You are not an activist. Yeah. You keep it on <laughs> that you yeah. not, uh, This is a complete. So, so I think we have discussed a lot. Thank you very much for all. I thank Gian Maria, Laura, and Sharon for all this interesting and challenging discussion. Uh, we will go on with the seminar. Next week, we will have David McDowell, who is the owner of Summer Hall. That's the reason why I was asking about the price of the return. That probably is not the priority of the curator, but if you are owner of uh, a hall that uh, show art, probably you have also this in mind. Yes. And you care less about the choice, or you care, you care about the choice of the artistic show that you present, perform, you present in a different way. We let him speak, and we let you know. Okay, thank you very much. Alan. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Ciao, Andrea. Ciao, grazie a tutti.